This is food for thought. How can the retirement industry harness this enthusiasm for a personalized approach without selling services to younger people that uh, really don't need them yet? This is 401k specialist editor in chief Brian Anderson, and this is the 401k specialist podcast. It's always helpful for retirement plan advisors to have a good idea what's going on in the mind of 401k participants, things they care about the most and things that worry them the most. We're going to learn more about what's going on in the mind of retirement plan participants these days, and we're going to do so right after this brief message. Discover the latest insights from Invesco's 2024 Defined Contribution Participant Pulse Survey, exploring the behaviors, concerns, and preferences of large DC plan participants across the U.S. Explore the findings at Invesco.com forward slash DC research. Invesco Distributors Incorporated. Today, we're happy to be welcoming back to the 401k specialist podcast, Greg Jenkins, Head of Institutional Defined Contribution and Managing Director at Invesco. We're going to ask Greg about the findings in some new participant research and about how advisors can help plan sponsors better communicate with their 401k participants about important current priorities such as lifetime income solutions, target date funds, and more. Welcome back to the 401k Specialist Podcast, Greg. Hi, Brian. It's great to be on with you today. Well, let's jump into a few questions. Now, I know Invesco has been doing participant research for a long time, but uh, can you give our audience some background and tell us what's new and different today? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've been doing financial language studies and behavioral research since um, all the way back to 2007. To date, we've done over 20 studies with six of them dedicated just specifically to 401k plan issues. And as part of these studies, we've conducted over 70 focus groups And I've been able to observe quite a few of these over the years, and it's been one of the most valuable experiences of my career. We found some common themes um, throughout the years. Number one, the power of positive messaging. Uh, Participants gravitate to positive communications to give them hope and make them feel confident. On the flip side, negative messaging or the old fear selling uh, might get attention for the moment, but it can cause people to feel bad and disengage. Number two, the importance of framing and presenting things in a straightforward and simple way. For example, showing investment options in categories. You know, the opposite approach is to display a list of 22 funds in alphabetic order, which I think everyone finds confusing. And then number three, um, people's universal distaste in financial jargon and the industry terms that we use with each other. Uh, not only are people annoyed by jargon, but it can lead to skepticism and distrust. So this year, um, we teamed up with Ipsos and we fielded a study uh, to over 500 active DC plan participants to retest some of those findings from the past and also see if things have changed as well as test some new concepts. All right. You mentioned uh, to me that there were a few surprises in the latest survey, but before we get into that, can you tell me what you learned about uh, overall about the mindset of the participant right now? Sure, Brian. So we asked participants what was keeping them up at night, and inflation, no surprise, was the clear winner at 46%, followed by market ups and downs at 23%, and recession at 21%. And we, we uh, took this snapshot in May, so keep that in mind. We also asked about top financial concerns, and there were seven choices. Higher everyday costs came in first at 46%, followed by large unexpected expenses at 35%, and healthcare costs at 34%. So factors like personal debt, job security, they were way down the list, uh, 22% and 15%. Really surprising to see job security Uh, so much lower than some of the other issues, especially given the AI threat to some industries. So we were a little surprised by that. Um, Overall, the top concerns are all about costs. I think it's important to point out, too, that it's not really the inflation rate that people are concerned with. It's the rise in costs that's already occurred, you know, starting back in the pandemic. But given those concerns, respondents seem to be somewhat optimistic about their retirements. One of the questions we've asked six times since the very beginning in 2007 over the years is, do you hope to achieve financial security or financial freedom in retirement? Now, I love this question because you can only pick one. 
And financial freedom was at its highest in 2007 at 40%, and as at its lowest in 2011 at 19%. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this year's survey, 32% of participants uh, picked financial freedom, up from 27% in 2020. And uh, 32% is about the same number we got in 2018. So that's encouraging. So people are feeling a little better. Probably not a surprise that younger participants tend to skew more towards financial freedom than older participants. Now, anecdotally, our research partners have told us that in the 1990s, so well before our research started, but in the 1990s, that the majority of people thought financial freedom was achievable, but that it all changed somewhere around the dot-com uh, bubble um, issue in the year 2000 or so. One of the things we discussed the last time you were on our podcast is the communication disconnect between employers and workers on how to turn a 401k balance into income. What did you find out about that issue this time around? Yeah. So last time I was on, Brian, we discussed our 2021 retirement income survey. And in that study, we surveyed 100 plan sponsors and they said, 78% said they had communicated about how to turn a 401k balance into retirement income, even if it was just, you know, help on setting up a periodic withdrawal with their record keeper. We found, so 78% said they had communicated it, but we found only 38% of participants remembered receiving the information on the topic, which was concerning. So this year, we were assuming that, you know, because this is such a hot topic, that that number would have improved. But surprisingly, it dropped to 30%. So only 30% said they remember receiving information on it. Um, and one might think, well, that's because only older participants are paying attention to this topic. But ironically, the reverse is true. Only 23% of Gen X and 30% of baby boomers said they remember receiving information on the topic. So this shows that there is lots of work to do in the industry to help participants understand their options in retirement. Again, even if it's just a simple setup of a systematic withdrawal. And since there's so many new participants coming into plans all the time, messaging needs to be repeated. And I think that's the big challenge with communications is that you have to go through this over and over as new participants come into the plan. Right. Okay. Well, you touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious, did you observe uh, many generational patterns or surprises in the survey? Yeah, we did. Um, we typically see some generational patterns in these studies uh, around a few things. For example, boomers are more concerned about investment costs. No surprise because they've got the big balances and they tend to be more realistic about retirement. Meanwhile, younger participants tend to be more optimistic and more interested in convenience. In this uh, survey, we asked participants what type of investment strategy they would prefer for their retirement savings. One based on A, the year they hope to retire, B, their risk tolerance, or C, a strategy based on their investment goals. In 2018, 29% said they wanted a strategy based on investment goals or a personalized approach. That jumped this year from 29 to 52%. Brian, in all the studies we've ever done, we've never seen a change like that. And uh, this group was dominated by millennials. 63% said that they wanted a personalized approach. Meanwhile, the preference for a target date style investment dropped from 34 to 22%. <clears throat> even below 26% who favored a risk-based approach. So what caused this interest in personalization? We were really interested in that. And when you think about it, it makes sense. You can customize so many things online now, and young people take advantage of that more than anyone. After all, you know, you can customize a mattress online and have it delivered in about 10 days. So why shouldn't people expect a personalized approach on their investments? So we're pretty sure interest in this sort of thing is going to increase. Now, the downside of this trend, and the irony I might point out, is that younger participants, even though they're the most interested in personalization, they're the ones who likely don't need to pay for personalization and would be better off just in a target date fund. So this is food for thought. How can the retirement industry harness this enthusiasm for a personalized approach without selling services to younger people that uh, really don't need them yet. So I think it's a challenge for the industry. Hmm. 
Interesting. Okay. We know that uh, target date funds are always an important subject for participants to keep up with, seeing as such a high percentage of them rely on TDFs, especially the younger ones. Um, Were there any new findings related to target date funds this time around? Yes, there were. After multiple surveys and focus groups over the years, we've seen some participants indicate that they're investing in more than one target date fund or no surprise, hold other investments alongside a target date fund. So we wanted to explore that further. In this year's study, 25% of participants said they own more than one target date fund and 11% said they weren't sure, which is concerning. 76% of participants said they own other investments in addition to target date funds. So when we asked that same group, the group that's investing in multiple target date funds or target date funds and additional investments, 67% said they were doing it for diversification reasons. And this is concerning, of course, because um, target date funds are, are designed to be diversified. So this was a lot higher than we are expecting. And it shows that there's work here to do as well. We need to help people understand what a target date fund does, how it works, and how well they're diversified. There also seems to be this prevailing notion in the industry that I've noticed that that everyone knows what a target date fund is. And and I think based on our research, uh, we can say that's really not true. I would have to agree with you there. So we know that you have uh, years of expertise in helping employers and advisors navigate the complexities of defined contribution plans and a unique perspective on what's driving innovation and participation in 401k plans today. So based on all of your research over the years, um, what would you say is the best thing that advisors can do to help uh, help their clients with DC plan communications? That's a great question, Brian. And I think this is an area where advisors can really add value with their clients. Plan sponsors tell us that communications is one of the most difficult issues that they deal with. So here are some things that advisors can do to help their clients in this area. Number one, don't simply rely on record keepers to handle communications. Get involved and really dig in on this this topic. Number two, review everything that participants see with your clients. So everything that touches participants, uh, review the language. Make sure it's simple and clear. Watch for the use of jargon or some of those made up words that our industry uses like glide path, which in our research, we found to be one of the most despised terms. If there's something your client doesn't like or wants to change, ask your provider. Uh, there may be options available, but you have to ask. Number three, look at plan data with your clients and try to identify trouble spots. So, for example, participants who should be saving more. Uh, number two, people Uh, in the wrong investments. Or number three, look for gender patterns or real uh, inequities uh, among uh, genders in different areas. And if you aren't seeing the data that you want in standard reporting, ask. You know, there's so many ways to slice and dice the data. And most record keepers are more than happy to provide that, but you, you really do have to inquire. And with your clients, decide if there's targeted communications that you want to try to address some of these issues. And then lastly, help clients think about generating some of their own communications to supplement what record keepers provide. So in many cases, this can be done, this can be done inexpensively, it can be as simple as email nudges or reminders. There's plenty of research that these nudges uh, do work with participants. We also have clients that have created their own video clips on surprisingly low budgets. Also, uh, check with target date providers or other investment partners that are in the plans and see what resources they may have that you might be able to leverage. You might be surprised. Um, And lastly, I would just say that helping with communications, it's one of the most impactful ways that you can help clients. And if if you really want to look like a hero, I would say, you know, get involved in communications and uh, see how you can help your clients. All right, Greg. Well, you've provided a ton of great information there. Invesco's Greg Jenkins, thanks very much for joining us today and sharing your insights on the 401k Specialist Podcast. Discover the latest insights from Invesco's 2024 Defined Contribution Participant Pulse Survey, exploring the behaviors, concerns, and preferences of large DC plan participants across the U.S. Explore the findings at Invesco.com forward slash DC research. Invesco Distributors Incorporated.